nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. All righty, I'm going to introduce the panel really quickly here because I want to get the, to the questions that were asked. Uh, just to review, these are the people that presented. Um, and you remember we did scale and intro with myself and Mario the first week, properties with Peter and Mario the second week, applications with Peter and, uh, and Jared the third week, characterization with Usker and West the fourth week. And then we had fabrication with Terry last week and myself and, and uh, Tony today on opportunities. And I, we did put them into a panel here. Um, I did spend a little bit, bit of time on this. Uh, I, so, so please, I, do, I am happy that people are laughing that I did. I, 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 it was, I wasted Bob, you look time. great in that dress. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's not the first time I've been in a dress, and there's nothing wrong with that. All right, there we go. <laughs> So yes, uh, I, I also put uh, I also put Oscar in a dress. So we've got <laughs> and Oscar. Is there anything wrong with that? <laughs> I'm so happy that he chose me. Thank you, Bob. I saw that you even like uh, arranged my shoulders so it could be perfect. I I did. I did. I spent a lot of time, way too much time on this picture. <laughs> anyway, uh, our. Um, our distinguished panel moderator, I'm going to have to, uh, the second moderator is supposed to be Dr. <laughs> Michael Lisicki. Actually, he had a doctor's appointment, and if everything went perfectly, he was going to be here on time. But I got a text uh, about a half hour ago that said, not go make it. So uh, you guys have met Al before. He's the external evaluator for our center, for our research center. He, he currently lives in Estero, Florida. Uh, he did work in uh, actually up in Connecticut uh, for many, many years, um, and he's been the evaluator of multiple AT projects, and he hired as an executive with Raytheon and uh, Sikorsky Aircraft. So you guys know the helicopters, Sikorsky's, he's, uh, he, he's had a lot of experience in industry. So I am going to turn it over to Al and let uh, him kind of take us yep. to uh, take well, us thank to the panel. Thanks, Bob. Um, for the benefit of uh, everyone who's participating, um, we got a great input of questions, uh, which I've organized into uh, five different categories. And we're going to ask the panelists who are expert in those areas to tackle the questions. Unfortunately, because we're really short on time, uh, please appreciate that, uh, you know, we're going to try to to respond to everyone and scoot through the questions that you've raised. The, the topic areas are going to be safe working practices, health and safety. Uh, all to do with curriculum is the second category from, from the lowest grade levels right through um, uh, college. Uh, and then lots of questions on nano applications in medicine. Uh, so we'll address that. Good questions on how to recruit and excite students and keep them interested. And then finally, some closing comments about business prospects in the nano field. So taking the first set of questions in health and safety, Bob, maybe you can tackle the first one. It has to do with risk assessment for nanoscale materials in the, in the area of health and safety. So if you're going to be working with nanoscale materials or, or, want to under, or you're a consumer and you want to understand risk, um, or should I be scared if it's in my washing machine? Um, I think that's really the intent of that particular question. Okay, and I'm gonna ask for some help from pan other panelists because I am not the person that's expert in this area, but I know that we, we have, there are, uh, there's a lot of work and a lot of research in, in nanomaterial safety uh, and, and environmental effects. Um, now, is there enough? I don't know. <laughs> I know that we're trying to learn our lesson from, uh, from kind of the past failures. Uh, there has been, there are several projects out there working on assessment of, of nanomaterials. And, and there are some um, uh, tests that I've done. I know that DuPont and EDI had a test a number of years ago to determine whether it was uh, moving forward on nano research was, was actually something that, um, you know, you, whether red, they gave it a red, green, yellow. Uh, but there is, there's significant work in this area. And I don't know if anyone else has any other panelists have other areas to share on that. 
Well, in, in the course in the NMT program that I teach at Penn State uh, and, and for the undergraduates and graduates, we examine there's documentation like from OSHA and NIOSH, and it gets periodically updated. And the, the interesting thing is, is there's not a lot of like laws. There's, mm -hmm. there's best practices and there's case studies. And that's what we go with now, you know, because in some senses, maybe for an example, the government recognizes carbon is like soot or coal. They don't examine the impact of like carbon nanotubes or bucky balls, but there's best practices list under OSHA and NIOSH, et cetera. But like MSDSs don't, don't explicitly uh, address those issues. So that's, that's a good thing and a bad thing. Well, it's a bad thing because people can get hurt in the immediate time in some ways. And I don't want to, underrepresent that statement. So that's bad. But it also provides a ground, which I tell students, this is an area that's rich with jobs. So people have to develop these studies and the safety thing because safety is important to most industries. So I think that it's, uh, you know, a, a, a moderately unregulated area, but an area that that is going to be an emerging area for jobs and characterization, et cetera. Actually, well, yeah. I actually wanted to let Peter share something that he, he put in the chat. So uh, why don't you share that really quickly, Peter? So at the beginning of June, starting June 2nd, if uh, this kind of health and safety stuff is something you want to learn more about, I put a link in the chat to a workshop that's supported by the MNTEC. Um, and it's uh, hosted by two excellent researchers at the University of Minnesota. And they really know their stuff on this. Uh, they're national experts on it. Okay, great. We have uh, two additional questions. Um, one has to do with the best safe work practices for nanoscale materials, and this would be in a workplace setting. And the other has to do with how do you train, teach students and train them to work in a laboratory uh, at, at college. Um, so perhaps Terry and Wes and Usger might uh, comment about how we train students at a college setting and also um, how we teach uh, best, work best and safe work practices for nanoscale materials. Well, in, in the course here, as I just said before, maybe I should have known that question was coming, that we, we examine best practices that are issued by OSHA and NIOSH for, for doing things. And like in our lab, and this is just us, I'm only speaking for our lab, we try not to handle like free nanoparticles. Like we don't get a, a jar of carbon nanotubes and then use them. We look at them when they're tethered on the surface, like if they're grown. And we like to look at things like nanoparticles that are suspended in a solution. So we try to prevent the case for like aerosolized nanoparticles because the particles are like a million, like at, a particle that you can't see, like a 10 micron nanoparticle, and you can see down to like 30. A, a, a 10 nanometer particle is a million times smaller or something like that, and it stays suspended forever with Brownian motion in a room. So we, we try not to work with discrete nanoparticles because they wind up for the most part captured in your lungs. So we, we work with nanowires, nanoparticles in a solution, and, and that's how we try to maintain safety in our lab. If we do want to examine those things, we examine them like virtually. We'll show videos and stuff of it that we don't put the student in that way for liability, et cetera, you know, mm -hmm. or just, you know, morality, I guess. Mm -hmm. Any other comments from any of the other um, panelists who, who work in labs uh, at your university? Are there specific training requirements or to make sure that a person's going to be safe? Yeah, we absolutely have a, um, a several week portion of, of the class on, on clean room procedures and policies and they get tested on it mm -hmm. before they ever walk in. Mm -hmm. And just to mention that um, on that list of resources in the slides, SCME is part of their... Um, online um, coursework, they have a whole module on that. 
on clean room safety right. and disposing of chemicals properly and not mixing acids and bases in the same same container and, and things like that. So um, there is information out there. The other, right. other thing I wanted to share real quick, Al, is that, that that's one of the certificates is the health and uh, uh, safety and hygiene certificate uh, is out there. We want people to, they need to pass that tests to be able to, you know, we want them to pass that test to take those exams. So we've actually collected that and we've actually had people from Erie and from, from Wes's program take these as part of the pilots of getting the, these things out there. So. Great. Great. That's wonderful. Uh, the next series of questions have to do with curriculum and I'm going to ask Mariel to kind of take the lead in them. So, because we, we have a number of different ones and I'll, I'd like to get through them fairly quickly. Uh, the first one is pretty interesting. It says, uh, what are some ways to make learning about nanotechnology a hands-on experience for middle and high school students without access to a lab? Right. Uh, so excellent question. <laughs> Thanks, Al. Um, it's, a, it's a great question um, because... Um, um, when I was putting together the course that I teach, um, you know, what do the, what are the students going to do? And as it turns out, there's a, there's a wealth of, um, hands-on, um, activities. I don't really necessarily want to call them a lab, but they're activities, um, that can be done that model what happens at the nanoscale. Um, you know, there are even some nano, nanoparticles that you can make. I mean, the, the there's a, a silver synthesis lab, and also a gold synthesis lab. And not only do they, are they on the NAC um, website, but you can also get, you can buy them as kits um, through uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. So the, their ICE program. So you can just type that in. So those are really accessible. They're absolutely high school level. Um, but then there, there are... Um, there are also lots of things like, for example, um, we, we talk about, we took, we, I do a lot of um, organic chemistry and polymers and the cross-linking of polymers can be um, turned into a, into a slime lab or a silly putty lab, which is something that, you know, you can actually put as much science in as you want and you still have them doing something that is kind of fun. Um, and um, when we talk about viscosity, so we were talking about the, um, we were talking about, Terry was talking about the, the mobility of nanoparticles and Brownian motion. When you, uh, when you're at the nanoscale, you just can't, the self-propulsion is extremely difficult because everything, everything around seems extremely viscous. And um, for them to study viscosity, I have them throwing styrofoam balls in the hallway and then recording the distance and, um, uh, drawing conclusions. There's also, um, there's just, there's a ton of them. Um, a, a lot of them come from, I will put it in the chat in a few minutes, a, um, uh, a book that NSTA sells that uh, has a lot of um, activities on them. And then I have collected them over the, over the years as well. So um, the, some, many of, really most all of it is in that doc that we shared at the beginning of the, of the second, second session, I think. I actually shared that doc earlier, Mario, too. The, the resources uh, and, doc. Yeah. Yes, I did. Yep. Um, Mario, another K through 12 question is um, what math concepts make the most sense to explore regarding nanotechnology? Right. Yeah. So that's a great uh, question to contrast with what we just talked about. Um, what I find is that, uh, what I have found is that the math surrounding um, nanoscience is, um, uh, I have not been able to find any kind of calculations that are, that are, can be simplified enough so that they can be done in, at the high school level. Most of my experience has shown me that it's not even at the undergrad level, it's like at the, at the graduate level. Um, my, I'm sure that we have people here that teach at the community college level, the uni university level that, that can do that. I have not been able to figure out how to do that. So, so while I do run an honors class in nanoscience, it's not math based. The, the mathematics that I do do have to do with um, uh, calculating things. You know, m many of the, them are chemistry kind of related and how many, maybe perhaps how many, how many atoms are in this nanoparticle, that kind of a thing. Um, and uh, so there's not, a, there's not a lot of math in there and that's, there that's okay. Go. There's a lot of reading instead and a lot of comprehension and, and extending of information. Right. Mariel, right. as a math teacher, um, one of the math concepts I've come up with is 
and now mind you, I'm working with seventh and eighth graders, but we did that activity <laughs> where they have to identify the size of each object and they learn to convert between standard and scientific notation. I also have them um, not only do the number representation, but to convert between micrometers and um, nanometers and like different units. Um, and the math, also I've had them graphing the reaction time of like, I do this thing with alka seltzer tablets and stuff. and <laughs> Which is surface you know. area to volume ratio. Yeah, you could. Yeah, and I do that with them. So, and I do surface area because I have to figure out the surface area of each tablet. Like when it's whole, when it's half, yeah. when it's quartered. Yes. So you're absolutely right, Angel. There are lots of ways in which, I guess that's like at, at the middle school level. and the, the Yeah, I mean, I'm not level, obviously, absolutely I'm just saying, you know, with my that. level. The, uh, the, right. So, so when it comes to like the higher level math, I, I haven't figured out how to wait a way to do it. However, it's an extremely challenging course, I think, because they're doing so much reading and so much synthesizing. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Go ahead, Al. Yeah, um, I think Mike Lusecki, you wanted to handle the next one? Thanks, so. Al. Hi, everybody. Tony, we got a question for you. What about your intro to engineering course? How do you integrate these nano concepts into intro to engineering? I, I'm sure that's a valid question for a lot of different colleges. Absolutely. Um, so we actually made the mistake of building a... <laughs> Um, a nano, pro an entire nano program. So um, we have an intro to nano course that uh -huh. is, has been approved as a gen ed. Um, so, it, you know, it doesn't have to be taken as part of a specific program. And we have a lot of interest from engineering, from the engineering technologies, the other sciences, um, you know, that, that might be a better way to do it. Um, yeah, but what if I don't want to build a nano program and I've got an intro to engineering? Right, but but I meant if you wanted a course, if you're talking about just integrating it into a course. Yeah, into an intro. To yeah, um, yeah, you can. We did it initially with rain. Uh -huh. You know, we we integrated lectures oh, idea. and then and then had some remote. Um, activities, even though it wasn't part of a lab, it was just part of an introductory course. Yeah, um, it, it really makes a big impact when students can see something happening live rather than um, just looking at a video. Sure. Right. So the absolutely seeing a measurement take place. And, you know, and initially we we let the person on the other end do that. We didn't even take control. It was just you know, to see somebody adjust the focus, adjust the magnification and watch things happen quickly because the person on the other end was trained on the instrument rather than us wasting a lot of time sure. um, doing that was very made of a huge difference. Like people actually sat up in the back of the room, sat up straight, you know, they were slouching in the back. <laughs> Wait a minute, teenagers never sit up straight. Well, they do if they're interested, Mike. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank, thanks very much, Tony. Um, we have a whole series of questions in the um, applications area around medicine. And if Peter and Jared could tackle some of these, we have uh, how is nanotechnology being used in medicine to fix eye diseases such as macular degeneration? Uh, we had a question about uh, using gold particles, um, gold nanoparticles in tumor treatment. Uh, we had a question, are there any nanotechnology, particle technologies other than COVID-19 vaccine in common use in the medical fields? So all about uh, nano applications in medicine. And then we had another one about uh, food and agriculture. Uh, nano application. So uh, since we're a bit short of time, Peter and Jared, can you tackle those? Well, I'll quick talk about food and agriculture. 
Uh, so one uh, great application would be uh, looking at colloidal particle size in milk. And we used to use our dynamic light scattering instrument and had uh, students uh, measure uh, the size of colloidal milk particles. And you can also do that with silver and gold particles. And I think Jared's probably the best at uh, talking about our uh, medical applications. So go ahead. Oh, well, thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, really, it's, we're right about at the time now where we are seeing more kind of nanomedicine applications come out. Um, I know in the, in the terms of the, the eye question, uh, I know at Caltech, they were working on a, on a sensor, little micro nano, well, a nano sensor you could embed into the eye and use it in order to sort of measure um, whether or not you have glaucoma. So, you know, there's that application in sort of using nanoparticles as measuring technology techniques, kind of like what they did with the, uh, the COVID test, where they used the, uh, the metal nanoparticles to just measure absorbances and see if you, whether or not you have the COVID. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work being done at the National Institute of Health. Uh, they're funding a big nanomedicine development center. Um, and they're really looking at, you know, especially with gold nanoparticles, delivering the drugs, using heat and light. Uh, basically, the idea is that you just shine light on the nanoparticles once you get them into the cancer cells, and that would create energy to destroy the cancer cells and hopefully be really directed to where those cancer cells are at. Um, I don't know how far away we are or if that specific application is going to, to happen, but, you know, it, there is research being done on it. Um, nanoparticles are having about a 17% annual, annual growth rate. So in their applications, um, you know, so in dentistry is another example, um, optical coherence, topography, uh, you know, so I think the nanomedicine applications, they're, I think they're just sort of seeing the potential of what they can do and coming out right now. It'll be really, I'm fascinated to see what happens five or 10 years down the line and which nano sort of base technologies sort of take hold in the medicine realm. Maybe I would like to add to this that, you know, nano carrier in, uh, in drug development is uh, originating from 1995. Actually, it's not a new topic. And I think that uh, Moderna or Pfizer would not have been able to put this vaccine together without the two decades of development in uh, nano carriers. The yeah. first one was for cancer, right? There's a lot of nanoparticles for cancer chemotherapy. At UCSD also, we have Michael Saylors, who is uh, studying uh, nano sponge, where you can load the drugs in, and it, it basically it allows for a very long-term release of the drug. And that is very helpful for the eye, for example. Um, you know, some uh, eye conditions have to be treated with a direct injection in the eye, which people, of, co of course, don't like very much. So uh, with nano sponge, what you can do is reduce the one month injection to two injections a year, right? So that's another application. Okay, uh, Mike, do you want to tackle the uh, last questions on recruiting and exciting students? I do, and it's the hardest questions. I'm going to start with you, Mariel, if it's okay. Uh, here's my question. What is the biggest challenge in recruiting students to come into your nanotechnology courses? And number two, what is the most effective way to encourage them or to recruit them into your programs? Biggest challenge and the biggest success factor that you've seen. Right. Thank you. So, um, so the biggest challenge is that students don't know what it is. They don't know what they're, what it, it doesn't fit into any of the silos that we built, you know, that, that the public education system builds, which is that there's biology, chemistry, and physics, right? And, um, and this is not all, none of them, it's all of them. And so, so getting um, students to understand that it is a, um, it's a different way of looking at a science and that it's, there, there's a ton of new research. And I think uh, Oscar said it um, way back in the sessions that all research is nano research. And so um, students of mine have gone off into the, the college setting and said, oh my gosh, Mrs. Coker, the, 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 the research that's going on in my chemistry lab is nanoscience. Yes, it is. They all, it all is. So, so it's, so um, that answers the first part of the question, I think, but the second part, how do you get them excited? It's hard. You have to have um, some way of communicating uh, um, your enthusiasm about it. And, um, and then you kind of, 
if you can get the kids excited, if you get a year of kids excited about it, then their enthusiasm will then help grow it. Um, you know, in my school, we actually, um, uh, I, I am constantly sending emails and sending announcements and, um, and then I am, uh, you know, there's a, there's a national nano day, which is October 9th, right? 10, nine. And so you, um, so you just make some, do something, you know, do some kind of activity for that. We've done a, a million nanometer dash, I think. Um, and right. then you post pictures of it and people get excited about it. So anything you can do to get their attention. One last follow-up question for you. What about attracting young woman? Any magic answer there into nano? Oh my goodness. Um, yes. So there's so, well, there, there's no magic answer, but but I will say that this has been an, an interest of, an area of interest for me. Um, women, um, because of the, the the general bias that exists in, in the air that we breathe in every day, um, women um, don't naturally think about these programs, and so they women I, I have found and girls need to be individually invited, like eyeball to uh-huh. eyeball conversation. It can be a quick one, but it's, but it's, you know, I think you have the skills for this. I think that you would be good at this. I think that you should think about this. And then once you plant the seed, then, then you will find that it, it, it grows. And then they start asking you questions and things. Um, that is the, probably the, the, the lowest hanging fruit that I can give you right now is just to invite as many young women and also other underrepresented populations. That's a great suggestion, Mariel. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, We're going to turn it back to you, all right? Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the panelists. Really very much appreciate the panels. And of course, our two moderators. Um, I definitely want to thank also Renee, who's doing awesome work behind the scenes. Uh, And Dr. Uh, Awadil Karim, who you really didn't meet during this workshop, but he's he's the reason we're here. He wrote the grant. To get us to this, and he's been a—he's our boss, uh, Oscar mine, Renee's, Terry's boss, and has done a, does a great job for us in uh, advocating for us and getting us these opportunities. And of course, the attendees. Uh, it looks like we have uh, you know over th- about 30 or so today, and we appreciate you for being here. And hopefully, this was helpful to you, and this wrap-up discussion was helpful. So thank you very much for that. And these are, I'm gonna leave these contact sheets and then just to make sure you're aware, all of our contact information will be at the end of this, uh, end of this last slide. Thank you very much.